kids can be dismissed. I don't always do theme days. Uh, I do for Mother's Day and Father's Day for the most part. I don't think I've ever veered from that. And it's kind of funny because last week as I got up early in the morning on um, Saturday, as I normally do to start preparing, I was getting prepared and uh, finishing up, wrapping up my sermon. And then I was going to head down to the corner to street preach with the men. And about five to 10, I realized that the next day was Mother's Day and I didn't have a Mother's Day sermon prepared. So I was like, oh. So I had to prepare a Mother's Day sermon in about five or 10 minutes uh, to get that ready for today because I figured I'd be busy all day long. Well, the same thing kind of happened to me yesterday. I prepared a couple sermons and I was all set to go. I was going to preach a certain thing. And then it dawned on me, Ascension, it has to be close. Well, don't you know, Ascension 40 days after the resurrection occurred Thursday. So we would celebrate the Ascension 40 days. It would be May 13th for this year. So I thought, you know, that's, that's a great subject to talk about the ascension of Christ because, and I was telling Ben this, we could be very close to the Lord coming back. Now, I don't, I'm not a date setter, but when you think about where we are, and what we've experienced, and now you've got turmoil in the world, you got the Holy Land with missiles being shared back and forth, you got unrest going on there. This week we have the ascension, and of course next week is... Pentecost, which is 50 days, and that's when the church began at Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, and you think, wow, and according to the Song of Solomon, the Lord's going to come probably in the spring of the year, when the time of the birds, and when the rain is over, and the time of the singing of the birds, and the flowers, and all of that stuff, that springtime, where he says to his loved one, arise my love, and come away. It could happen. It could happen. And if the Lord decided to come, I wouldn't tell him no. <laughs> I'd be like, even so, come Lord Jesus. Okay, so we think about the ascension, and today that's what I want to focus on. Now, I think what I'm going to do today and next week is use John 21 to begin this. Okay, so there's quite a bit of scripture in 21, so I might skip over just a little bit and save that for next week. But I want to turn to John 21 and begin this here with the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 21, John 21. John 21. Now, all of chapter 21 happens after Christ is risen from the dead. And I'm going to take a look at the last verses in all of the Gospels today. Uh, this will be my plan and talk to you about what they wrote in regard to the last events in the life of Christ before he was ascended. John 21, it says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. Now, this is written in 21, in chapter 20, he appears to Thomas, which was definitely a week after he resurrected from the dead. So Thomas missed the greatest service in the history of the world by not being there the night that Jesus appeared. And then they told Thomas, we've seen the Lord, and he doubted. And of course, the next week when they were meeting together again, the Lord stood in the midst of them, and he went right up to Thomas, and he says, behold my hands and my side. And he challenged Thomas, and Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says the, the words to him, blessed are they who have not seen and yet believed. And I have to say, I commend all of you because we haven't seen and you believe. You know, your faith is what has saved you and your faith is what's going to get you to heaven. And the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. We have to believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And we trust and believe by faith. The world doesn't like that word. They don't like that word. And as man gets more wicked and more carnal, the less faith man has. And the more he wants to see to believe. Well, the Bible says very clearly, Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh what? 
a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You want to see a wicked and adulterous generation. And basically that's where we are. They want signs. Show me and I'll believe. Show me scientifically that you can prove this. I had a, one of my friends challenged me um, from high school and he said, scientifically, give me proof. You know, it, it's, and then when you start trying to give him proof from the Bible, he shuts you down. He won't even let me talk about the Bible. And I said to him, I said, you won't let me get a word in edgewise. If you won't let me talk about anything in the scripture, try to give you any scientific proof, how can I even try? But he's not interested in knowing scientific proof. He's just in his mind. That's He just wants to see, wants to see, wants to see. Show me something. I can put my finger. Listen, blessed are they who have not seen and yet believed. Okay, now, again, the events follow. Here he is. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. Now we have some fishermen in here. I'm one of them. And if somebody says to me, I go a fishing, you want to come? I would probably go. I love the fish. There's just something about casting a line into water and not knowing what's underneath and feeling something on the end of your line and hooking that thing. It's just something about it that is attractive to me. I love to fish, love to fish. And I love to win souls. So the Lord said, come unto me and I'll make you fishers of men. So again, the way you fish for fish, fish are likened to men. So you throw that bait out there and each fish you catch differently, don't you? Those that you know how to fish. You don't fish the same way for trout as you do for bass. You don't fish the same way for bass as you would for a catfish. I mean, you want to go, little Justin was saying, I want to catch a big catfish. What do I have to do? You need to get very stinky bait, very stinky, rotten bait. And chicken livers work very nicely. Left out in the sun to rot and decay and put those on a big old hook and throw those in there and you catch big, big catfish. We've done it down the river. You can catch some very large catfish down there. So catching fish, you have to catch men in the same way. Come, I will make you fishers of men. Present the gospel to them. Again, a great way to present the gospel. You want to catch fish, be fishers of men, pass out one of these. Hey, and this is a great way, a great tool. Look how beautiful that little bag looks. If you wanted to, you could add a little bow around the front, you know, or some, hey, our church has given out some gift, a free gift from our church. Look at that. We've got a devotional. We have a Bible in there. We want to give that to you to read. Here, gift from our church. Oh, thank you. Nobody ever gave me something. That's nice. You know, you made a friend and now they might read it and they might get saved. You put the bait out, haven't you? Read it. Come to Christ. That's what the Lord's talking about. Come unto me, and I will make you fishers of men. And we should all, we should all be zealous to see souls get saved. It's dawned on me lately, too, and this happens to me every once in a while, where the Lord will put hell on my mind. He'll just put a vision of hell, and I can't get that out of my head. And I just, in my head and in my thoughts, I think about people going to hell, and I see them and hear them crying, and and it's just like I I try to push it out of my mind and I think, wow, a person's going to go there and be there for all eternity. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. And the Lord does that to me because it's the reality of things. Listen, around us, people are perishing. They're dying in their sins and going to hell because they, no one's telling them the, the good news. And, and we keep our mouths shut. And as much as it's burden in me, I pray that the burden from me comes to you as well and that you will be burdened to win people to Christ. I mean, to snatch someone out of the fire and get them saved. How important it is to get up and get that word of God out and, and to witness to people and challenge them about their souls. You say, well, people don't want to hear. It doesn't matter. It's our duty to tell them, to warn them, to be that watchman. And I've told people lately, I say, you know, the Lord has set me up as a watcher of souls. I am a watcher of souls. I am a watchman that the Lord has set up 
to watch for your soul, even though you may not even care about your soul, to watch for it because you see the impending doom and the damnation that's coming to this world that is pushing Christ away. We need to do all we can to be those fishers of men that the Lord has wanted us to do. And it said here, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Now, usually that's what happens with me. <laughs> that We have toiled all night and caught nothing. Uh, you know, kind of a joke. You go out fishing uh, and come home with nothing. But you had a good time anyway, right? Uh, a bad day on fishing is better than a good day at work, so they say. Verse 4, but when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, children, so again, they didn't know it's him, and I don't, they're out there praying pretty good ways, so he raises his voice, I'm sure. Children, have you any mate? They answered him, no. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship. He had heard that before, right? He had heard that before. Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast, therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Imagine all night long they toiled and caught nothing. Children, have you any meat? No! Cast on the right side, and ye shall find. Who is this guy? On the right side. Oh, man. And the water begins to erupt, right? The nets. We're not going to be able to pull all these in. And Peter said, ha, ha. You know, all of a sudden the light bulb goes off in his mind. Oh, something greater than the multitude of the fishes. That's the Lord. And again, wasn't it, Peter, that before the Lord said, do this. And Peter said, not so, Lord. We have toiled all night. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will put down the net. And when he did, they had to beckon to the, because the ships began to sink. That's how many sh uh, uh, fish they had there. And he come in and he says, depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. And he confessed before the Lord. Well, Peter, right now, again, and this is what I'm going to talk about next week at Pentecost, and get into a little bit about what happened with Peter and how he gets right with the Lord, and God uses him greatly. And I want you to understand this, that in your life, sometimes you can go on at the beginning with a fervor for Christ and serve God with all your heart and soul, and sometimes indifference can come into your heart or something can offend you, and you can turn away from the Lord, and you can spend years away from God. Does that mean God's done with you? And how many Christians today are just sitting there idle and doing nothing for God? God can still use you no matter what. And those that are out of the race for God, they can jump right back in. It's the devil's ploy. Well, God can't use you. You gave up on God. God can't do anything. That's what the devil does. He'll say those things to you. Uh, you're a sinner. You're rotten. Look at the way you think, the way you act. God can't use you. God's done with you. You're just a wicked, terrible sinner. And it'll convince you that you are. And the next thing you know, you're giving up on God. Don't let the devil win out. Yeah, we are sinners, aren't we? And yes, we know the Bible says for all have sinned. And we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And this is where you need to rebuke the devil and say, the Lord rebuke thee, Satan. I know him, those things. But the Lord still loves me, amen? And the Lord can still use me. None of us are deserving. Even Jesus said, after we've done all that we can do, what should we say? I know you like this verse. He's smiling up here because he's quoted it many times. After all we've done, what should we say about ourselves? We are unprofitable servants. We are, Lord, 
unprofitable service. We have just done that which is asked of us. That's basically it. You asked me to do it, I did it. But in it all. And doesn't he say that he doesn't even put trust in his saints and his angels he charges with folly? I mean, even they fall short. But don't let the devil talk you into quitting. Keep going. And I'll tell you, and again, I'll talk about this next week a little bit more. If Peter had quit, if he had quit, what would have happened at Pentecost? Thank God for second chances. Thank God for third, fourth, and fifth chances. We serve a merciful and faithful and long-suffering and forgiving and tender and compassionate and wonderful God, don't we? All right, so Peter gets, he gets his heart all excited here. It says in verse 7, uh, verse 6, And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. He's always provoking Peter. John is always kind of ribbing Peter. It's the Lord, Peter. You've been waiting for this opportunity. It's the Lord. Now what happens next? Verse 7. It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt him his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, uh, and cast himself into the sea. And he grabs his fisherman's coat. <laughs> he didn't even put it on. He just Row! over the side of the ship into the water. I'm getting to the shore. I got to see the Lord. I got to see the Lord. Cast himself into the sea. And then the other disciples came in a little ship. But they were not far from the land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Okay? So Jesus had it all prepared. And he says to them in verse 12, Jesus saith unto them, And one day we're going to hear these words, Come and dine. Boy, the heavenly meal, huh? Come and dine. If this message doesn't get you excited, maybe the heavenly meal will. The Lord is going to gird himself as a servant, and he's going to wait on you, and he's going to say, what would you like? And he's going to have that little towel hanging over there, and he's going to say, what would you like? What would you like? Huh? What do you like to eat? Chocolate. And he's going to bring a plate of chocolate. What would you like? T-bone steaks. <laughs> and I can hear the cow in my mouth. He's got a fresh one right there on the hoof. And she's a dandy. Slay and eat. How about a pizza? Oh, yeah, how about a pizza? How about a plate of seafood linguine like your husband makes and some super sata. In fact, Pete will be up there working and making that <laughs> super sata. He'll be one of the only ones that doesn't get to sit down, you know. Yeah. Lord says, Pete, how your super sata is so good. You take a break. You go over in the kitchen there, you know. And Pete, I'm supposed to be eating here. Well, we got to have your super sata. Go make us up. All of this, the Lord's going to say, come. And dying, coming down. If you're discouraged today, think about what heaven's going to be like and how the Lord's going to gird himself as a servant and wait upon each of us. I don't know how big that table's going to be, but it's going to be a large table. But every one of us is going to get an individual visit from the Lord, I believe. And the Lord's going to split himself into billions of pieces or whatever he does and come to each of us and say, what, what would you like? I'll get you anything you want. And we can sit there and eat for about three or four days or three or four weeks and taste everything that heaven can offer. Amen. Let's go, right? Let's go. Come and dine. Come and dine. Okay, so this happened before the ascension. And I want to go from here. I like the verse in 25 where it says this. I want to sc scooch over to 25, and then we'll go to the other Gospels as well. And there are also, 
in verse 24, this is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's go over to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Now you're going to notice here, Jesus eats with them as well. So I think he puts some emphasis on eating. So he says, come and dine. He's making sure they got fish prepared. Jesus sits and he eats with them. So it tells you something about the resurrection body as well. And all of us need to understand that when we get to heaven, we're going to be able to eat the same way we did here. When Christ rose from the dead, when he rose from the dead, when he appeared to them, to, to, to Thomas, he had the holes in his hands, the holes in his feet and in his side. And he was, he was basically flesh. But it was a glorified type flesh. And he said to them that, touch me and see. A spirit, they, they were afraid it was a spirit. Remember the one verse? He says, a spirit hath not flesh and bone, as you see me have. So it tells us something about our resurrected body. So if the rapture were to happen right now, the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise. Okay, so what's happening here? If the dead in Christ are rising, that means that the dust that's here in the grave, let's say someone from the 1600s, totally turned into powder. Their bones, everything decayed, and their everything is just laying there and it, and it went back into the earth. Maybe there's just a remnant of powder left. And they hear the voice of the Son of God because they were saved. The Lord causes this miraculous trans transaction as it occurs they come up with that body and all of a sudden it becomes flesh and it goes to heaven and at the same time their spirit and their soul come down and meet that body in the air and they come together as one and at the same time we hear the voice and we have whole flesh but yet we go out and it appears our blood stain, uh, stays, glasses stay. And if it were to happen right now, everything on me would fall to the ground, including my hip. Weird. And I've thought about this many times. What happened if I had a heart transplant that was somebody else's heart? <laughs> Am I going out with somebody else's heart? What if I had that big liver transplant and the old liver got destroyed and I got the new liver and I'm standing here with Joe Schmo's liver and the rapture happens. Am I taking Joe Schmo's liver out with me? <laughs> Tell you the truth. I'd like to have my own liver and the hip bone that's gone. That was incinerated, burned up. I'd like to have that old hip bone back. You say, well, pastor, you're, you're asking a lot. You think I'm going to go out with that hip? I'm going out with that hip. I want that hip. And I want God to change that hip and make it glorified. I'm going out with what I came into the world with. And when I get there, as Job said, yet in my flesh shall I see God. And if it were to happen today, I believe that I would drop this vest this microphone, these glasses, this watch, this Fitbit, this shirt, the T-shirt, the deodorant, the shoes, the socks, the hip, fall to the ground in a pool of blood, and people would be like, and hopefully there'd be nobody left here. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, don't mean to freak you out, but if you're not, if you're not totally sure, you better get saved because you say, oh, you're, no, as sure as I'm standing here, this is going to happen. It might not happen in this particular setting, but if it did, I'm telling you right now, Pastor Kevin's clothes would be left here in a pool of blood and I would be out of here. You say, why the blood? Why the blood? The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. When Jesus died, he, 
all of his blood he got rid of, all of it. And when they pierced his heart on his side, out came what? Blood and water, the final residue of fluid that was in him. And then he clearly says, now I could be off on this, but he clearly says, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone. You think he would have included that blood? How important that blood is to the flesh, but he says, flesh and bone. We're going out and we're going to see them in the clouds and we're going to meet the Lord in the air. And the ascension, what the ascension means to me of Christ is, it's just a picture of what's going to happen to us. He's coming back one of these days. And he puts a lot of focus on eating, on eating. Now, I like to eat and I'm not real picky. But there are certain foods that if you put in front of me, I could, I could downright gorge on them and have a good time with them. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 and verse number 36. All right. Jesus eats with them and then leads them to Bethany. Luke 24, 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. Now, you might wonder from a medical perspective, and I have to tell you, this is a wonder of mine. This is a wonder of mine, and I'm just going to be very candid with you. I'm a medical person. I understand the systems of the body. I understand them. I know the circulatory system. I know the respiratory system. I know the urinary system, the digestive system. I've studied the systems of the body. If God gave us these systems, won't they work forever? If it's glorified flesh, will we still breathe? If it's glorified flesh, will we still have a heart that pumps? God made man that way. Jesus Christ was made that way. When he resurrected, he was still able to eat. Now, some may say, did his heart still beat? Did it? While he was standing there, wasn't he resurrected? I mean, think about this. Was he breathing? Was he? Did he have to? He was dead, but he came back. Why the need to breathe? Why the need for a heart? You're going to eat. Are you going to produce anything that goes through your colon? Is there a need to urinate? Who thinks about this stuff? Anybody think about this? I think about it all the time. I mean, constantly. Constantly, I can't stand how much I think about it, to tell you the truth. I want to get it out of my head because I think about it so much. Because I don't have the answer. And it, who, who, do you do it? I think about it. It's hard. Yeah, right, exactly, because we can't figure out what is going to happen. Right? You're going to walk out here today and say, oh, did he confuse me? No, I don't mean to confuse you. But I want you to understand that these things are a shadow of what's coming, and we look into a glass darkly, but then face to face, and we'll understand it all someday. How can you eat, put it into your body, and your system not work or work? So, of course, I know where you're going with that. In heaven, will there be a need for waste removal? <laughs> it's somehow going to work into your system where your body will use 100% of it all the time. I, 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 can't, I can't explain it because I can't get my finger on it, and I wish I could, but one day I will. One day I will, but Jesus ate, 
and he took it and did eat before them. So if you eat it, your saliva has to break it down, has to work. You say, well, he didn't need to do all. He could just ate it. And pastor, you're thinking way too hard on it. There are those in here that thank God you just say it happened and I'm good with that. And if you're like that, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I know my father-in-law is like that a lot. He'll say, it just happened, and I'm good with that. You know, me, I'm like <laughs> getting an ulcer over thinking about something that you can't even figure out, okay? But that's me. That's just the way I've been made. I don't know. He took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And thank God he'll do that for you as well. And said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem, until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Okay, so now we got Luke's rendition of this. We've got Mark and we have Matthew. And I want to save Mark for last because Mark contains one of the greatest things for us. Okay? I want you to go to Matthew. Let's go there. Jesus' last commands. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. And look in verse 16. Matthew 28, verse 16. We have a lot of work to do, folks. We have a lot of work to do. We should never say we're bored. Never say you're bored because there's so much to be done. Go work for the Lord. We could work from sun up to sundown for the Lord. There's so much. Look unto the fields, right? Look unto the fields, for they are white already to harvest. The Lord sends us. His last words were, go, 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 go. Get out, work for me. Get out into the fields. The precious fruit of the earth is rotting, decaying, falling, and it's being damned and sent into hell to perish for all eternity because there's no laborers out in the harvest. How important is God's harvest? How important is God's vineyard? Look unto the fields, the world, white already to harvest. I challenge you, if you've never witnessed to anybody please take the opportunity to pass a gospel track out, to challenge somebody about their knowledge of Christ. Hey, here's something for you to read. Are you a Christian? Here's something for you to read. Do you know where you're going to go when you die? Here's something for you to read. I care about your soul. Here's something for you to read. Do you know the Lord? I can't reach everybody. Donnie can't reach everybody. Benjamin can't reach everybody. And all of you that witness, you can't reach everybody. There are people that you know that I will never reach. God has put them in your life. And I believe at the judgment seat, when we stand before God, we're going to give an account of everybody who's crossed our paths. And I'm telling you, shamefully, I'm going to say, Lord, I didn't witness to all of them. And Lord, I let some of them go. And Lord, I was just downright lazy. And Lord, I'm sorry. And I'm going to watch people that I love, people that I've met, even just for the first time, people that, and they're going to be cast into hell because they didn't know the Lord, and because I was too whatever not to tell them. I'm telling you, folks, all of us are going to give an account of our stewardship before God. And the Lord's going to say, did you do what I commanded you to do? What was the command? He said it after he was resurrected, right before he ascended. Clearly, Matthew 28, Matthew 28, 
in verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go, go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So that's how that one ends. Let's go to Mark. I saved the best for last. This is called the Great Commission. The Great Commission. If you've ever wondered what, when people say the Great Commission, what is that? The Great Commission is the commission to preach the gospel. <clears throat> and it says, and I think Pastor Mike has this at his church. He has it either on the back or on the front. He has, go ye into all the world. Go ye into all the world. And some churches have put on their church, we got this here, uh, when I married Ben and Miranda, they gave me this plaque and I decided to put it here. This is wonderful. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And then we got our scripture there. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. And then what we should have on the way out is, you are now entering the mission field. You are now entering the mission field. When you walk out of that church, out the back door, you should know you are now going out into the mission field. Or we could put, go ye into all the world, like it says here, the Great Commission. It says in uh, verse 14, Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Very clear. You get in, you get saved. You don't believe, you're damned. I mean, I self-explanatory. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. And they went forth and preached everywhere. What did they do? They took it seriously, didn't they? And thank God they did. Because I'll tell you what, it's probably because of them and most definitely because of them that we're here today. And how the gospel spread around the world because of them. And I got to say this, and I want to talk about my father-in-law again. And he's not here talking about him a lot today. <laughs> but his people in the Bible came from the southern part of Italy, it, Italy down there in the southern part in Calabria, which in the scripture is down there called Regia, Regia, okay? So if you read that in your Bible, you'll see that there was, a, there was a pocket of believers in the southern part of Italy that came right from the area where my father-in-law was raised in Italy, a pocket of believing people, Christians. And it looks like Paul went to that group there that some of those could have gotten saved back through his generations. And you have to think, Maybe God honored previous generations in his life that were faithful to God, that got saved, and led him over here to get saved. He got saved here, and thank the Lord, all of his generation that has come from his loins, from him, have gotten saved. Go ye into all the world. What did they do? They preached the gospel everywhere. Where did Paul go? Where did he go? He went on three different missionary journeys. He went into Italy. He went into Greece, Asia Minor. He went into Jerusalem. He went into Spain. And some say that he went all the way where? To England. Some say Paul went all the way up 
into England. Did those revivals that come in those areas come from Paul's preaching? You know, the one thing, they took the command of God seriously. And they did what he said to do, and they went. What type of legacy are we going to leave behind? What type? As Americans, we're beginning to fail God. And as Christians in this country, we're beginning to fail the Lord. At one time, the gospel had spread all the way around the world because of missionary and evangelistic efforts from the American people that had gotten saved. We took it seriously. And now we're backing off for Christ. To end this, Jesus doesn't stay here. But 40 days after he resurrected from the dead, he gets to a point where he knows he's got to go. And he's got to leave them. And he sends the promise. And next week we'll look at the promise of the Father. But the ascension can be found in Acts chapter 1, is where he actually goes out. And I want to end this with going to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, and we'll be closed in this chapter. Acts 1. Acts 1 and verse 1. Acts 1 and verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So you know it's 40 days. That's what tells you right there. 40 days after the resurrection, the ascension happens. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Thank God. Thank God, all of us that are saved have been baptized with the Holy Ghost. It says in 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Little did they know it would be almost 2,000 years away and maybe even greater. Wilt thou at this time? No, he didn't answer, but we know it's been that long. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times, or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. It doesn't stop there. And unto the uttermost part of the earth. How far are we away? See, oftentimes we think we're the center. America hadn't even been discovered shall be witnesses unto me in these regions and into the uttermost part. The gospel got brought over here by faithful people. And thank God someone faithful told you. Someone faithful told you. And you're sitting in here today saved because someone faithful told you. You might not have liked it at the beginning. You might have said, I don't want to hear that. You might have even cussed and sworn and said, get away from me. I don't want to hear that. It's kind of like the story of the meat cleaver, you know? Billy Randall, the man I got saved under through Pastor Cunningham, he was a crazy man. He was crazy. When he preached, he's crazy. I mean, every vein in his head, his face looked like a tomato every time he preached. He just knew one, one style, and that was just full bore, scream the whole time and preach. And this guy could preach. He could bring conviction. But he went into a butcher shop one day, and he said, I was determined to get that butcher saved. And I told that butcher, you're going to die in your sins and you're going to go flat right out of hell. You better get saved. And that butcher said, you better get away from me. And he went back in and he talked to him again and talked to him again. And finally, that butcher said, if you don't leave this, I'm going to chase you down with this meat cleaver. He said, I don't want to hear about your God. I don't want to hear about your salvation. I don't want to hear it. I'm not getting saved. Get out of my store. Or I'm going to hit you with this meat cleaver. And he refused. And the man Chased him out of the store with meat cleaver. You know what he did? He ran around the back. And he went back in. And he said, you're going to get saved. You know what happened? The man put down his meat cleaver. And he got saved. He said, you win. 
I get saved. I don't know if the man would have hit him with a meat cleaver or not, but he got saved. He got saved. He took it seriously. He was, he was challenged. Listen, he wanted to win souls. He had a compassionate heart for souls. Do you have that kind of heart? You say, I don't want to get hit with a meat cleaver. <laughs> Neither do I. Find another way to win them then, right? But try. Try. It says, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you and shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, I love this, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. They promised. It says, you saw him go. He's coming back, and he's going to come back. Are you ready? Are you ready? If you're listening today, and those that are on Zoom, because I don't know who's listening, and I don't know who's saved, I want to give you an opportunity to accept Christ as your Savior. Don't put it off. As I said, if the rapture were to happen now and you weren't saved, you would be left behind. I don't want to see anyone left behind. If you don't know the Lord, why don't you pray with me and ask Jesus Christ to save you and mean it from your heart. The scripture says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You could do it right now. You could pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, pray after me. If you want to be saved, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I'm sorry for my sins. Lord, I now repent of my sins. I don't want to go to hell. Lord, I know you died for me. I know you were buried, you resurrected from the dead, and that you can save me and forgive me. And I pray, dear Jesus, that you would come into my heart right now. Be my personal Lord, my personal Savior. Forgive me for my sins. Wash me clean with your blood. Save me. Take me to heaven when I die, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being merciful to me. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. And if you meant it, you got saved. And praise the Lord. Amen.